Uh, we are recording. <laughs> that's why I. That's why I alerted you. Yeah, it's like when Monica Lewinsky had that conversation with her friend, and it was recorded. Yeah. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Have a touch, please. All quiet, please. Thank you. Go ahead, take your notes out. We're going to be continuing with, um, let's see, uh, Hitler. And we'll get into his good buddy Mussolini. And then we'll get back to uh, Hitler. Okay? Um, reminder to you, um, got some of you guys, I'll be seeing some of you guys right after school today, one at 3, three o'clock, Jeremiah, uh, 3.30, Dante. Uh, the other two spots are actually taken up by folks on from the Blue Day, but it's kind of like afternoon for some of you guys is blue green, you know, whatever, because of some of your classes that you are attending every day. It's, if you are in a position where you need to be getting something to me, just clarifying, you'll need to get that paper to me first, and then we'll set up. Um, I know I was talking to some students about that before we get started here. Um, so, not surprisingly, um, I'm going to be setting up meetings after the break when students get those papers to me after the break, okay? So be on top of that. Um, at this point, we've got plenty of time for you guys to uh, get ready to turn in your final IA to me by May, but you do want to take advantage of those things. Yeah, I've already talked to some of you, actually quite a few of you guys. Mia, Tessa. Bunch, Haley, I've already talked to some of you guys. I'll talk to this week, some of you guys I've got right after the break. And there actually is quite a few spots right after the break. Um, so we'll be in good shape there. Okay, questions, comments? What is the um, spirit day today? Don't you guys get that through Instagram and stuff? I haven't been getting official announcements. There's things in the hallway. Something red. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> That's your, your, your little, like, your little heart for Mao or something? No. Actually, that is, um, you'll, you'll see. Yeah, thank you very much. You'll see, uh, I covered this with the seniors, and um, <laughs> Cultural Revolution was something else. They have struggle meetings, and it's not on Zoom. They actually show up, gra grab people, and they have instruments, lots of percussion instruments. Shh and hundreds of thousands of people die. And sometimes shh, students show up and they actually beat old people who used to be capitalist or like, you know, ties with Taiwan, things like that. And Mao would encourage it all until he discouraged it. Okay, so anyway, uh, this is being recorded, <laughs> by the way. Okay, <laughs> I'm just saying it's being recorded. Yeah, that's like, oh, what was I reading? Um, sh the uh, Canadian Olympic Committee was alerting its athletes that when they go to the Winter Olympic Games, which is next, I don't know, January, February, they're being held in Beijing, that they just need to know that if they're there in China expressing themselves as they would, say, in Canada or the United States or whatever, if you're saying whatever you're saying that's on your mind in China, don't be surprised if the Chinese government, shh, uh, might prosecute you and so forth. Because that's what they do in China. But they, w they won't do that publicly? Oh, yeah, it's kind of like, where did, where did Jack Ma go? You know, where is he? I don't know, who's that guy? <laughs> Danton who? You know, <laughs> just, just be like, just be like, I mean, Stalin, they actually used to, when Stalin would disappear people, shh, they literally would go to a lot of, a lot of trouble, and this is before, um, you know, modern um, camera techniques, okay, Haley, camera techniques and so forth, they would go through and they would literally like Photoshop out people. But eventually, Stalin's people were like, they were disappearing so many people so quickly, and I don't just mean disappearing, they were like erasing them from history. They would just put an X on the picture where the person was that you weren't supposed to see anymore. And then people would look at the X and go, they're gone. I mean, literally in their mind, it was like, they're gone. Not going to mention them anymore. We're not even going to talk about them. Oh, it does if, he, if you're like trying to give the Mao version of, excuse me, the Stalin version, that's a diff, uh, of history. As in, oh, they didn't ever, 
Now, Trotsky, Trotsky who? Did he participate in the uh, development of the Soviet Union? No, not according to Stalin. All right, speaking of our country, let's go ahead and stand for the pledge. Oh, you don't like our country? No, I don't. Wow, well then try and improve it. Oh my gosh, you guys. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. One reason why sometimes people come to this country isn't because they like the culture so much, it's because they want to get away from restrictions on freedom where they live, and they're happy to come here because there's a lot more. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of, <laughs> there were people trying to get out of Italy and Germany mm, prior to World War II. You guys ready? Let's do this. All right. All right, here we go. All right. Um, we've got our notes out. Come on, let's go. Chop, chop. So where we left off, <clears throat> this is very important. Dates matter. Adolf Hitler was able to rise to power uh, by 1933. He had been successful, his party and him, in the November 1932 election. Cole, what event, economic event, had occurred in Germany and other parts of the, most of the world that helped? The Great Depression, yeah. And it helped Hitler to sort of look and go and say, hey, I'm going to put people back to work. It's going to be great. We're going to make Germany great and awesome. We're going to tap into our roots. Support me. And he did. He got a lot of support from that. Of course, if you looked really closely in the Nazi platform, what do you suppose? Did they highlight, um, let's kill Jews? No. no. Did, they, did they criticize Jews? Yes, and they tapped into that and so forth, and they are the problem, among other things, and socialists and communists. Um, but they toned down that, um, let's see, genocidal component. And in fact, you're really not going to get a full-on genocidal component until pretty much the world is shut out from access to what's going on actually in Germany and then German-occupied areas in World War II. That's when you sort of have sort of like a curtain drawn on all of those areas. And there will be an effort to deny what is actually going on during the Holocaust. Although, at the same time, Hitler wanted to make sure that all these things were happening. And so there were plenty of records making their way back through command to Hitler to show him that his orders were being carried out. Jews were being rounded up and killed. Right? So, I mean, when people like after, the, uh, after World War II go, no, the Holocaust didn't take place. Um, yeah, can we look at your evidence that you collected, Nazis? to see, in fact, that this actually did occur. But notice this. Put this down. The key focus on this is German greatness. Okay? And a lot of Germans, you know, could look and go, yeah, we've been really pretty bad about ourselves. You know, we lost World War I, and, and we had to, like, take the blame for this, and, and then we had to pay all this money, and, and, man, it's really hard. And the Great Depression was hitting Germany very hard. Of course, it was hitting the United States very hard, too. But we didn't go full-on dictatorship. They did. Had we had a full-on dictatorship in our country's history? No. No. I mean, the closest you get to it occasionally is like when we're in a really big war. I mean, Abraham Lincoln throws Confederate sympathizers in jail because, you know, they, you know, they're kind of you know, causing a nuisance. And in World War I, there were some restrictions which there wouldn't be otherwise. Because it's like, oh, I don't know, you know, German speakers and so forth. And there will be some restrictions as well in World War II. We'll get to those later. But Hitler starts throwing restrictions all over. What, I Evan, mean, was the name of the law that was enacted after Hitler came to power um, to basically sort of like take away political competition, take away lots of civil rights? What was the act that was put into power in 1933? Um, and it actually occurred right after the Reichstag fire where Hitler and the Nazis, which they were actually behind it, they were blaming communists and opponents for causing this. Now, propaganda, what's, we're looking for the name of the law. Enabling Act. Enabling Act, yeah. So that's the consolidation of power to Hitler. That was where he becomes the Fuhrer, the leader. You got that in there? Fuhrer means 
the leader. It's a German word that means the leader. Okay? It made it easier that the president, who was the president when Hitler came to power as the chancellor? Hindenburg. Hindenburg. Okay, the old guy. And when he died, Hitler's like, eh, let's not replace him. I'll just take, um, combine the, all those leadership roles together under me. Okay? We recall that, of course, one of the things that really helped Hitler um, in power was, even though he was anti-democratic, he definitely tapped into um, ideas that sort of like consolidated the greatness of Germany and so forth, and the greatness of Rome, taking Roman symbols, I think we talked about these last time, and the Roman salutes, and the use of propaganda is going to be very important. If you haven't already, I know yesterday, I'm not going to like even bother asking here, yesterday I was checking with some of the Blue uh, Day groups, and they're like, really? Um, I never really check Google Classroom to see if you give us assignments, because your class doesn't often give assignments on those like non-days. I'm like, you need to watch that video and take careful notes on it. Shh. Okay, Evan. Total War, um, the first uh, World at War series with the new Germany. Very, very helpful for this unit as well as setting up for the World War II unit. Talking about what takes place in Germany, we're going to go through some of those officially in notes here, but that video, very, very important. It's 45 minutes, 50 minutes. Um, some of the students yesterday said they had watched it already. They put it on one and a half speed. You could still figure out what Lawrence Olivier was saying as the narrator. Okay? So, key thing. Before Hitler comes to power and after, propaganda is key. Use of radio as a way to uh, express what the Nazi party is saying. And, of course, after they come to power, that's the only version you're going to get. It's absolute total censorship of the media. And the media at that time, of course, is print. You know, you've got print media. You've got radio media. Goebbels is making sure that the word gets out, the Nazi official word gets out. And, of course, then the film media is going to be very important as well. Uh, Lenny Refenstahl. It's fascinating because after the war, she's not rounded up. I mean, Goebbels, I think, ends up... I'm trying to oh, he's dead. That's right. He dies the same day along with his wife and kids uh, that Hitler died because he was in the bunker. But Lenny Refenstahl ended up having a film career afterwards. She stayed away from propaganda movies. She did lots of really excellent documentaries and so forth, films having to do with diving, scuba diving. Yeah, I remember watching a weird documentary about her life. It was like, I don't know, it was called like The Incredible Weird Something Life of Lenny Riefenstahl because her early years were like, she was Hitler's filmmaker. And then later, <laughs> she was kind of like, don't bring that up, please. Let's just talk about fish, you know, and, oh, <laughs> and yeah. coral reefs and, you know, whatever. So, but she did. She was a very excellent filmmaker if you <laughs> overlook the fact that she was working for one of the biggest sons of guns in history. Okay? Um, and, of course, Hitler as a speaker. That's one of the things I'll show you a little clip here. Um, I don't know if we got to it. Did we get to, did we get to the little Hitler speech? All right. Anyway, and the, um, sorry, I don't need to show that. But the, uh, the documentary that I had you guys watch um, Gives you a real good sense because there's some good ones on there that shows you like how he, he uses quiet and how he builds things up. He uses gesticulation, his hands, and it can be very, very powerful and compelling and um, frightening, really. Because people, it's kind of like, wow, I mean, are there people in the world today that just sort of like shut out everything else and the only thing they listen to is the one who they believe is telling the unvarnished truth about the way things are. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, well, you can see that ultimately folks in Germany, I mean, the number of folks in Germany that either saw the danger of what Hitler was going to be bringing to Germany and the world, um, that got smaller and smaller. Uh, maybe they didn't, maybe they did see it, but they knew once Hitler was in charge, you don't speak out because he institutes the secret police, the Gestapo, and it becomes very dangerous to express criticism. Which is why, Mia, a lot of people ultimately, Jews in particular, because they saw it most clearly, because his laws are going to be very, very anti-Jewish. They're going to try and get out of that country. Even though they have years and years of family history in Germany, they want to get out because they want to get to freedom. Okay? Albert Einstein is an excellent example. He came to the United States as an immigrant. Why? Does he like the United States culture and popcorn and peanuts and you know, French fries and things like that? I don't know. 
it was because he wanted the, the freedom and uh, freedom from repression. So, yeah, Hitler. Put this down, though. Focus on, we want to focus on, uh, this is going to be bullet number two, actually. Hitler learns from Mussolini. Hitler learns from Mussolini. Mussolini is the original Italian fascist, right-wing dictator, who came to power in 1922. Hitler learns from Mussolini a game plan for how to set up a totalitarian dictatorship over a country. Hitler is going to look at Mussolini as the guide, as the, the mentor, as the leader, as the template, but eventually Hitler will go, you know what, actually Germany is bigger than Italy and I think I'm doing a better job. And by the time we get to World War II and you look and compare Hitler and Mussolini, let me see, which of them has military success, at least in the very beginning? Hitler, Hitler, Hitler. Mussolini, oh, what a mess. So it's, yeah, go ahead. How so? Well, actually, they're on the same page. I mean, we can see, uh, here's a picture of Hitler and Mussolini. Um, they're actually going to be really good allies. Yeah, they're going to be, I mean, they're like total allies during World War II. They're on the same page as far as their politics and so forth. But, and it's not just Mussolini, it's, it's a little bit sort of like, you know, Italy versus Germany. I mean, where would you go if you wanted to like a real chill, like beach, warm water, vacation? Okay, you go to like a Mediterranean country. Okay, Germany has a reputation of being more, particularly northern Germany, of being more like, we're going to get this thing done, the Prussians and, and, and efficiency and engineering. You know, those are generalizations and stereotypes. But under the command of Hitler, it's going to be like, we are going to get to work and win some wars. And they're going to win. I mean, they're going to beat France within a, less than a month. They'll beat Norway and Denmark and Poland. I mean, they're going to beat people all over the place. Italy, though, you can make a little note of it. Yes, they're going to get thrown in there. Yeah, yeah, Belgium and Netherlands and Luxembourg. Italy, just make a little note on this sort of for future. Because we'll see this when Italy fights in World War II. We'll get to World War II later. When Italy fights in World War II, they're supposed to like, Hitler's like, okay, you take Yugoslavia and Greece. And then I'm going to focus on attacking the Soviet Union. What? You can't beat Yugoslavia and Greece? Oh, my gosh. All right, fine. I'll go in and help. You guys ever have younger siblings that are giving us responsibility to do, and then they quite, can't quite get it done? Maybe because they're young, although you're like, they're not just young, they're just, God, they're just not a competent. And so then what do the older siblings do? They step in and take it over. So who beats Yugoslavia and Greece? It's going to be Hitler's army. Same thing happens in North Africa. Italy's armies under Mussolini are supposed to conquer like Egypt and so forth. It was like, oh my gosh, you're not getting it done. Pfft, I'm going to get in there. I mean, it's like, is there any like, consequence to that? You'll see later on when we get to the World War II notes, when Hitler is delayed attacking the Soviet Union because he's cleaning up the business of Mussolini and uh, uh, finishing the job in Yugoslavia and Greece, it hurts his ability. Because it's like, I don't know, if you're going to attack the Soviet Union or Russia in history, what is one season you kind of want to have things kind of wrapped up before it comes in? Winter. Exactly, winter. Because winter is additionally a challenge to be engaged in fighting on the offensive in the Soviet Union. So anyway, um, but here's what you do need to know. When Mussolini came into power, um, it is going to be quick and it's going to be decisive. All right, here's some details. Mussolini. Um, after World War I, uh, he's a journalist and a socialist. So he starts out as a left-winger. Yes, he's a socialist. But he's going to be discontented, as are many Italians, as of the outcome of World War I. I mentioned this before. Which side in World War I was Italy on, the winning or the losing side? It's kind of a trick question. They started out, yeah, they started out with Germany and, and Austria as allies, and then they're like, let's switch. And then they predominantly focused on it and fighting Austria. 
And so they were on the winning side. What did they want? They wanted a lot of Austrian territory. That they were like, this is really Italian territory that had been taken over by Austrians in the past. Make sure you have this. There was a lot of discontent in Italy. They felt like they didn't get enough land. So there's a lot of feelings like Italy should be like, we should focus on Italy. Let me see, is there a political thinking that like focuses on like your nation first above all others? National socialism. I'm not saying that's not right. National socialism, also known in Italy as the fascist party. So when you hear somebody say, oh, they're a fascist, is a Nazi a fascist? Yes. Are they a national socialist? Yes. What's the nickname for his national socialist in Germany? Nazi. Yeah. In World, in World War I. By the end of World War I, we were. No. No, not really. No. I mean, at the very, very end, after Mussolini had been overthrown, you know, the Italian government was no longer fighting against us. But we were in Italy fighting predominantly German soldiers. Yeah, they lose. And so then they're sort of like sidelined. Mussolini is going to be, Mussolini will be dead quite a bit before Hitler. Okay? We'll see that when we get to World War II. So Mussolini's in Italy, and he's forming up his fascist party. And, of course, they have, write it down, a paramilitary component. And as we saw before, the paramilitary component is in the streets, fighting like the communist and socialist paramilitary components, as well as competing in the elections in this quasi-democratic country. Now, of course, the irony is Italy had been officially founded by a king in the 1860s with the help of political advisors. And there was a king in Italy, and there will be a king actually throughout Mussolini's rule. The king is Victor Emmanuel III. But if you look at the king and the kind of power he exerted, well, he doesn't really exert much power. He doesn't really get that involved. Kind of like that. Only it's very, very pathetic because the Queen of England, I mean, if somebody tried to like set up a dictatorship in Britain, I mean, <laughs> I think the British monarchy would have something to say about it. But when Mussolini, write this down, in 1922, Mussolini and his fascists march on Rome. As in, they go to the Roman city, the capital of Italy, and they try to take over the government. It's like a coup. It's like a political coup d'etat. They're like, we're just going to take over. They bring in their paramilitary forces and so forth. I mean, it's like, who do you expect to like, stand up and go, oh, that's not what we're supposed to do in our country? Maybe the king? Does it look like the king is sort of like going, yeah, you're a bad guy, Mussolini, and you're hurting democracy? No. Make sure you write this down. Victor Emmanuel III really does nothing to stop Mussolini from grabbing power during a chaotic time period in 1922. You got that? <laughs> no, and they took the whole city, and they took the whole country. I mean, here's the thing. Yeah, it's kind of like... I mean, you look at this and you're like, let me see, the IRA took the post office with the Dublin uh, Rising in 1916. Did they ultimately win? Yeah. Initially, no. Hitler, back it up, takes a beer hall, right? Here we go. Takes a beer hall in 1923. Did he succeed that day? No. He ended up in jail. Did he ultimately succeed? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, you've got now, and of course, Italy, they take the city of Rome, and they win. Yeah, and so Mussolini will be the dictator from 1922 onwards. All right, let's talk about his dictatorship. What are some of the themes of his dictatorship that Hitler will go, yeah, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. Okay, one, takes complete control of uh, the government. So no more free elections, no more um, competition, political competition. He calls himself, oh, he's got a nice name for it. I'm going to spell it for you. Ready? Il Duce. Okay? Haley Il Duce is spelled, first word, Il, I-L, capital I-L, and then Duce, D-U-C-E. Okay? The leader in Italian. He's the leader. He's the dictator. He sets up a, make sure that he's going to have support uh, among the people, he sets up the secret police. The Italian, the secret police. 
So the Italian secret police, sometimes they're in uniform, and it's not so secret when they knock on your door and they want to talk to you about some of the things they've heard that you're talking about at work. And you're like, wow, I didn't know anyone was listening. <laughs> sometimes, shh, the secret police is secret. They're not in uniform. They're infiltrating to find out what's really going on. Mm -hmm. That happens. I know people in the regular police who've actually infiltrated various different organizations in the past. I remember actually having conversations with somebody's parent once upon a time when they were wearing a beard and they were like infiltrating successfully, I believe, like drug operations. I'm like, that's cool. <laughs> you never heard that before? Oh, you said, it's like, yeah, no, I mean, that was early. That was early in the career. You were probably about yay, yay high yeah, when that was taken. That was pretty cool. But I mean, here's the thing. Were there any like limitations on the secret police in Italy as far as like, I don't know, civil rights and you know, criminal justice rights? Yeah, they want people to be under control, okay? Um, labor unions, they could not go on strike. So basically, the government took control of labor unions. Okay, so no more strikes. All that leftist stuff, communists and socialists and stuff, it's shut down. But here is something that some Italians really liked about Mussolini. He made the trains run on time. Here's the quote, write it down. Mussolini got the trains to run on time. You're like... Oh, well, in Germany, the trains always run on time because this is Germany. Things always. But in Italy, sometimes the trains don't run on time, and it's really annoying for Italians. They're like, oh, my gosh, can't we have a government where the trains run on time? And then somebody today will go, well, they did during Mussolini's time. Well, <laughs> woohoo for Mussolini. Oh, my gosh, really? Seriously? Do you have to have a fascist dictator in order to get, like, timely transportation? I mean, seriously, is that, it's like, I don't know, freedom or get to work on time. I just want to get to work on it. It's like, what the heck? Anyway, that's crazy. Um, another thing that Mussolini is going to be involved in, write this down, is he wants to have an empire. Now, if you thought Germany was late to the game when Germany was created, right? And Bismarck was like, don't try and create an empire. You're just going to upset the British, and then you're going to be at war with the British. And, you know, that advice was followed until it wasn't followed. And that caused all pro kinds of problems leading up to World War I. All right, so let's look at this. Italian expansion. If you're the Italian leader, let me see, is there something in history having to do with Italy that, like, was really great once upon a time? Are you kidding me? Roman Empire? Yeah. yeah. Mussolini just, like, totally he's like, well, I'm going to be like, he's like, he saw himself as, like, the modern incarnation of a great Roman emperor. Seriously, write that down. He literally, he had constructed... I want to say it probably is about the size of this room. He had constructed a model replication of Rome, including the Colosseum and all the, the key Roman buildings at the time of ancient Rome. And he would go and he's like, oh, this is good. And of course, you know, he tried to build some edifices to himself in a ancient Roman style in Italy. You know, all these big suits, columns and so forth. He's like, yeah. <laughs> And, yes? Is that Most of that just has occurred well prior to that. So, like, if you go, like, where the Roman Colosseum and so forth was, after the Roman Empire, I mean, it was the barbarians and so forth that took that down. And if you were building a house and you're like, I don't know, where can I get some good stone? Yeah, exactly. They would just, like, mine, literally mine, you know, take... You know, reuse stones and stuff, you know? Anyway, so but here's the deal. Mussolini, write this down. Mussolini wanted to recreate this great empire, you know, Roman Empire or Italian Empire, whatever you want to call it. A little bit of a problem because the Roman Empire at its time had, like, control over the entire Mediterranean Sea. So he's like, well, you know, I can't really, I don't want to, like, take on France at this time or Spain. I mean, hello, I'll help a Spanish uh, fascist come to power. But he turned his attention onto other areas. This map is helpful because it will show you the green areas. He starts out, obviously, in control of Italy and Albania, just across the water. Albania was Italian. Albania was actually the poorest part of all of Europe and still is, still has incredible economic challenges. He had control over Libya in North Africa. So that's where they kind of started out with and they also had Somalia along the coast of the Indian Ocean. 
So what is he going to do? He's going to like, well, I got big plans. Well, here's the big plans. They will take certain additional territories prior to World War II, one of, the main one of which is Ethiopia, okay? Right here, right next to Somalia. And if you look at this in like these sort of shaded greenish areas, light green and so forth, that was the goal, <laughs> ultimately, to have complete control over Yugoslavia and Greece and expand, take Egypt away from British influence and not, I mean, and Sudan from British influence. I mean, he had big designs. Big. Because it was there and take it away from the British and the French and so forth. You know, it's going to be big. We'll have this big empire. Yeah. So, who was going to stop him? Well, write this down. 1935. In 1935, Italy attacked Ethiopia. This is actually pretty pathetic because Ethiopia it was maybe one of the last independent areas in all of Africa. Liberia was still independent. Still made, made up of like former U.S. Uh, slaves. Can you name an international organization at the time in 1935 that would have like objected to that? <laughs> Thank you, you got that right. Write it down. The League of Nations. Some of the other classes like the United Nations are like, you got the nations part, right? The <laughs> United Nations isn't going to come into existence until, like, after World War II. Yeah. So the League of Nations was there. And here we go. League of Nations, 1935, says, shame on you, Italy. You shouldn't do that. So did they organize, like, a military defense of Ethiopia? No. Write it down. No. It was clear that they were powerless. Uh, that's not how the white man's burden was interpreted, historically. The, the white man's burden was, the, sh the burden is, I'm going to take upon this bur burden to govern you, you poor African, um, it's very racist thinking. You poor Africans who can't govern yourself, I will take upon the burden to bring you my civilization. That's the white man's burden. Oh, I mean, it fits, yeah. I mean, but here's the, uh, here's the thing. If you look at Africa at the time, how many uh, parts of Africa were under the control of ostensibly white countries? Like all of it, yeah. And so poor Ethiopia, they're like, can we save it? Can we, oh, here comes Italy. And Italy, Italy takes it over in 1935. You got that? Wow, that sucks. And write this down. We'll develop this even more. In, uh, during the Spanish Civil War, write this down. During the Spanish Civil War, Italy and Germany will take sides in the Spanish Civil War. They're told not to. And they're like, no one's going to stop us. We'll develop that much more clearly when we get to the details of the Spanish Civil War. But just know this. When they're having a civil war, the Italians and the Germans butt in and help out one side. <laughs> and guess what? That side wins with a fascist dictator named Franco. Okay? Yeah. So actually... By the time Hitler comes to power in the early 1930s, Hitler's going to look over and go, yeah, I'm gonna fo I've been following what you've been uh, doing there, Mussolini. I like what you're doing. You're going to be my ally. Put this down. anti common turn. That is the organization. Uh, that is the alliance by 1937. That is the alliance that Italy and Germany will have prior to World War II. And ultimately, it's kind of interesting because... Hitler and Mussolini, both right, far right-wing dictators, they hate these two groups, communists and liberal democracy. Okay, so communists, Soviet Union, liberal democracy, Britain and France, etc. So what is this alliance focused against? Which of those two? Anti-common turn. Anti-communist. So this is an anti-communist alliance. Got that? So that's the first alliance that's going to be clearly formed. Anti-communist alliance. The far right wing will have an alliance against the far left wing. It will be joined in short order when Franco, General Franco, finishes the Spanish Civil War by 1939. And there's Franco smiling all buddies with Hitler. Hitler who helped him to bomb certain areas including Guernica, as portrayed by the Picasso painting. We'll show you more on that later. Um, Hitler, who helped Franco to win that war. 
I think I asked this question before. Austin, do you remember? Why was it between Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco? How come Franco ruled until the 1970s, whereas Hitler and Mussolini are going to be dead before World War II? Do you remember how Franco managed to survive World War II? If he's all buddy buddy with Hitler and Mussolini. Anybody else remember? Tessa, you remember? Exactly. Write that down. Just so you have it already. And we'll, we'll reiterate this. Spain stayed neutral during World War II. So there was no official reason to get rid of him. Actually, somebody asked in one period, they're like, if Spain um, hadn't been neutral, could the United States and Britain have overthrown Spain and gotten rid of Franco? Probably. You know, we ultimately uh, kicked the Germans and defeated Italy. We conquered, we won in North Africa. We ultimately won in France. I mean, none of those are easy to do. Could we have uh, taken on Spain as well? Maybe. But Spain had stayed out of the war, so there was no reason to officially go in there. Okay? All right, now, let's get into the details uh, leading up to Germany entering into World War II. All right, here we go. This is in capsule form what that video you, if you haven't watched already, you need to watch that. This covers 1933 all the way to 1939. Ready? Here I'm going to talk about 1933 all the way to 1939. And predominantly in a territorial sense, as Germany expands and Germany does things, some of which are like, okay, well, you know, you're violating the Versailles Treaty. So, if, for example, put this down. 1933, when Hitler comes to power, um, he leaves... Germany leaves the League of Nations. Write that down. 1933, Germany's like, I'm not even going to bother with the League of Nations. Why hang out with a bunch of people who we're not going to listen to anyway? Okay? So Germany leaves the League of Nations. And, of course, this has been the, the refrain ever since 1919 when the Treaty of Versailles was being signed. Oh, my gosh, the Treaty of Versailles is so unfair and stupid, and we shouldn't follow it. Well, most Germans agree clearly on that when it comes to, like, paying the British and the French and the Belgians and so forth. But what about some of the other parts? Write this down. Hitler started to rearm Germany, which is also a violation of the Versailles Treaty. He'll come up with all kinds of ways of violating the Versailles Treaty. And of course, then the, then the question is, well, what's the, going to be the consequence? Right? Have you ever babysat and told a kid, you cannot do this, and then the kid did it? <laughs> what do you do? Do you just like draw a new line? <laughs> well, Hitler started to rearm. Let's give you some examples. By rearming, it was like, let me see, there was a limitation of 100,000. They start to kind of like go beyond that. I mean, initially, it's sort of like, well, we got 100,000 officially in the military, but we've rotated so many men through, we have well more than 100,000 that are capable of fighting. They're trained and so forth of fighting. But eventually, they'll just ignore that limitation. Do you remember the other limitations as far as the kind of military they could have? Do you remember, um, yeah, Garen, do you remember what kinds of uh, weapon systems the Germans were not allowed to have? Give you a couple clues. One of them has to do with the sky and one of them has to do with the water. U-boats, very good. All right, they were not supposed to have any U-boats. What does Hitler do? Start building U-boats, <laughs> okay? And anybody uh, for the sky part? Yep. No, no. In the sky. I mean, it shoots in the sky, but something that's in the sky. Air Force, yeah. Germany was not supposed to have an Air Force, so he builds one. And a very good, effective Air Force, as it turns out. And, they'll, and during the Spanish Civil War, the Germans will give an opportunity to sort of t test it out a little bit. Fly over Spanish cities and drop bombs. Okay? That's what he's doing. And what do the British and French do? And, of course, Hitler says this. Make sure you write this down. Hitler's always saying, don't be alarmed that this was an unfair treaty, and this is all for defense. This is all for defense. This is just for the defense of... You know, if somebody's walking around Idaho with a gun, do you feel threatened? Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe if they're, doing, if they're just carrying it, right? You know, open carry, they're just walking around with a gun? No. I mean, is it... Do you take them fully at their word that that's personal security, protected by the Constitution, Second Amendment? There you go. I mean, so that's what Hitler was saying. 
Now, I mean, that's not to say that somebody carrying a gun in Idaho is like Hitler and really has intentions of terrible things, but that's what he's saying, and he's tapping into that notion of should countries be able to arm themselves for their own security? And all the other countries are going, well, we do that, so Germany should be able to do that too, even if it is a violation of the Versailles Treaty. But yeah, I mean, that was then. We, can we trust Hitler at his word? This is going to be the testing period. Can we trust Hitler at his word? Early, after Hitler started violating these things and going, don't worry, it's fine, it's fine. There was one British politician who said, I don't trust you. <laughs> You're bad news. You're dangerous. We should, we should object to this. Winston Churchill and all these British people are like, you're such a warmonger, Winston Churchill. You're such a warmonger. Can't we take Hitler at his word? And Churchill's like, no, I know this guy. So when we finally figured out that, that, uh, that, that Hitler was lying and you can't trust him, guess who the British ultimately came up with as their leader by the time World War II came along? Winston Churchill. He will be the wartime prime minister for much of the war. All right, here's the next one. This one's actually kind of small. Take, write it down, S-A-A-R, the SAR. It's a little teeny tiny territory. You can barely see it right there. It's a border territory. It's got mostly German in it. It's right near France. And the agreement already was they were going to let those people vote. And this is, all, this is all actually quite legit. It's the only real legit thing that's going on here that Hitler does. 1935, they have an election in the SAR, and they vote to join Germany. So Hitler's like, hey, elections, joining Germany. That's cool. Let's just continue on that path. The SAR, it's a little teeny tiny region. I mean, it's about as big as, it's actually a little bit smaller than Luxembourg. S-A-A-R, the SAR. Okay, the SAR rejoins Germany. That's in the third bullet point right there. The next thing that Hitler does, though, should, historically, people look back and go, they should have stopped, they should have, they should have stopped Hitler in this situation. Take a look at here in the western part of Germany, this sort of orange area. Write it down. This is the Rhine land, either side of the Rhine River. Okay, so it's a river that runs from the south to the north. Okay, well, that's fine. It's border territory, Germany to France, Germany also to Belgium and part of the Netherlands. The Versailles Treaty said there will be no German military in the Rhineland. In other words, Belgium, France, it's cool. You're never going to have to see German armies across the border. Well, in 1936, Hitler sent in his military into the Rhineland. He remilitarized the Rhineland. And he didn't ask permission. He just did it. And, of course, he was saying as he's doing this, don't be afraid. Exactly. This is for defense. Don't be alarmed, Belgium and France. We are not moving our military into this part of Germany in preparation to attack you. <laughs> we, we're just doing this. Would Britain, France, and Belgium been within their rights to militarily oppose and fight and send the Germans out? Yes. Historically, sometimes historians look at this. You make a little note of this. In 1936, Germany's military wasn't as big as it will be right before World War II in 1939. If Britain and France had taken the initiative and gone in there and actually kicked the Germans out and fought if that would be, history would have been quite different. But did, Germ but did Britain and France want to have a fight with Germany? Did, did Hitler know that? Yeah. This is what the British Prime Minister said at the time to the British people. We're not going to oppose this. It's as though your neighbor is going into his own backyard. You shouldn't be alarmed at your neighbor going into his own backyard. Um, there's going to be people that will eventually refer to that, allowing Hitler to kind of break all these terms of the treaty as appeasement. Make sure you have that word down. You never heard that word before? This is basically like a parent or a babysitter letting a kid get continually away with breaking the rules. Appeasement. And so it continues on. The next situation is going to have to do with Austria. Okay, we're getting closer to the beginning of World War II here. In Austria, 
March 1938. In March of 1938, Austria will have an election about whether or not it is going to join Germany. What is called the Anschluss. Because there's a bunch of Germans in Austria. And they're like, well, I mean, Hitler is an Austrian initially. And they're like, well, let's have an election there. Have you guys ever seen The Sound of Music? Right? That's set during that time period. Captain von Trapp, he's against joining. And eventually he and his family and his uh, former nun bride will cross over to the Swiss border, make their way to the United States, and set up a ski lodge in Vermont. Guess what happened like right before they had the election in Austria? Hitler sent in the troops. And then they had an election with German troops all over the place. Guess what the result of the election was? Austria joins Germany. And did anyone lift a finger to stop that? The British, the French, and so forth? Nope. Nope. They didn't. Because they're like, well, we don't want war. We don't want war. Oh, we haven't even got to the worst of it. We'll get to, next time, we'll look and see how Hitler manages to sweet talk the uh, British and the French into giving over Czechoslovakia. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, but we're, we're, we're done one time today. So we'll get to the rest of Hitler's shenanigans next time.